today's video, we'll take a look at this Bible. It's a New American Bible, St. Joseph edition. It is the book that I did the um, breaking in video on. We'll start by taking a look at the box. It's a two-piece box. So it's a medium size, this particular one. There's a larger size that has about a 10-point font in it. This one, medium size, is about a 9-point font. Here is the style number. BG stands for Burgundy. It is a, a simulated leather. It is one uh, step up in terms of quality from uh, this style that the same company makes. This is an imitation leather, but it's really very stiff and thin. This has a little bit more flex to it. Um, I will show you on the box some of the features. And we should find the ISBN here. I'll also put the ISBN down in the summary of the video. Dimension wise, it's eight and a quarter, eight and a half inches tall, six inches wide, one and three quarters inch thick to give you a sense for how large that is compared to some other Bibles. Here is a standard Douay Reims. This is a reproduction that I found in a used bookstore. Roughly the same size as the Dewey Reams. It is not as tall as the Revised Standard Version 2nd Catholic Edition from Ignatius Press, nor is it as wide, but it is definitely thicker. And then finally, it's a smaller book than the Didache Bible here. So the Didache Bible is taller, wider. And they're roughly the same thickness. So we will open it and take a look at the inside. The text is laid out in two columns. Each column is 54 millimeters wide. There are about 45 characters per line, as many as 55 lines of text per page. So on a page that has no breaks and no footnotes, you'll find 55 lines. The page dimensions are 206 millimeters tall and 139 millimeters wide, so that's 8.1 inches tall, 5.47 inches wide. The print is generally dark and somewhat bold. The margins are at the top, 12 to 14 millimeters, at the bottom, 11 to 13 millimeters. The inner margin is narrow, but it can be as much as about 12 millimeters. The outer margin is 11 to 12 millimeters. The font in the text, when I compare it to Times New Roman, is about nine points. So these capitals are about the same size as a capital in Times New Roman at nine point. It's advertised as nine point. Line height is 3.22 millimeters. So that's from like a baseline to a baseline. And that converts to 9.1 points. So it's appropriate. And to me, it looks quite nice. That is not too close. You see this D and that G. There's sufficient space between them not to cause any trouble. Um, verse numbers are in superscript inside the paragraph. Uh, the text is not line matched. It's not a problem, though. I think it's pretty clear that the text is not line matched. And as you can see, the text is not line matched in this edition, but I don't think that's really an issue because the paper is relatively opaque, as we'll see in just a moment. Words that the translators add for clarity are not in any special kind of format, so you will not see italic font here. Pronouns for deity are not in capitals here. So you see he referring to Jesus as lowercase. I prefer that because there are places where it's not clear who the pronoun refers to, and then the translator is forced to make a choice that's interpretive. I'd rather do that interpretation on my own. Um, there are interpretive notes at the bottom of the page. Those notes are marked in the text with an asterisk. And I do like the fact that you can read backwards. You can go from the footnote back up to the point the footnote refers to very easily because of this uh, verse number that's given here. 
the font here in the footnotes is about 6.5 points. It's sans serif. References are done in a similar way. References are also in a font that's about 6.5 points. They're in their own separate section here, marked about with these horizontal lines. And um, references in the text are marked with a letter. And then in brackets, you see the source. So if you want to go back and find that reference in the text, you just go back and look at 828. And here at 828, you see the L. It's a very straightforward system. Uh, I prefer center column references, but this seems to work fairly well. The paper has a sheet thickness of about 43 micrometers. Now my measurements here probably aren't as accurate as they often are because of their, the inserts of thick paper throughout this volume that we'll talk about later. I wasn't able to measure the thickness of the entire volume at once. I had to take a few smaller sections. But I think the th thickness of the sheets is about 43 micrometers. I estimate the paper weight at 39 GSM. There is a very light gloss on the surface. It's not much of a problem. Let's see if we can get some of that to show to you from the overhead lamp. And I think you may be seeing some sheen through here. But it's not a serious issue. There's a light blue tinge, and you should be able to see blue in the gutter. The gutter tends to amplify any, uh, any pigment on the paper. The show through is very weak. Uh, you can look here in the blank space where, where a print is uh, on the opposite side of the page, and it really doesn't cause much trouble. There is some print non-uniformity. We'll show you pages. 423 and 425 simultaneously. I think that's about as bad as it gets. So 423 on the left is a bit darker than 425 on the right. But not a lot darker. So noticeable but not severe. There are book introductions for most of the books. So we'll go back here. We're close to the beginning of 1 Corinthians. There is an introduction for 1 Corinthians. It's in about a nine-point italic font. And you can freeze the video and read this, and that'll give you a sense for the detail of information you'll get in a book introduction. Book titles are placed in the outside top. Uh, they're also in the margin and a little rectangle with an abbreviation for the book title. Book contents are chapter only, and they're alongside the book title. Page numbers are center top. There are headings, running headings, along the top. They're in about an 8.5 point font here. And then you also have bold headings in the text. They're also in about an 8.5 point font. Chapters are divided by an all caps word chapter with the chapter number beside it. So rather than having the, the large numeral over here in the corner, which is a, a common thing these days, they, they do this style. Um, books of the Bible do not, in general, uh, start on a separate page. So with my luck, we won't find one of those here, but it's fairly common for a new book to start mid-page, the introduction will start as the previous book ends. So here's the end of uh, 2 Samuel, and the introduction to the book, first book of Kings begins here. And I'm happy to say, as you can tell here, uh, the words of Christ are in black ink. So you don't have any kind of problems with uh, misalignment, with, uh, apparently it's really difficult to lay down red ink evenly, so you'll often see fading in red letter Bibles. You don't have to worry about that here. At the end of the book of Revelation, which is where we are here, immediately thereafter there is a list of collaborators, Old Testament, New Testament, uh, Psalms, and New Testament, and then collaborators from 2010. So this was 1970, 1991, 1986, 2010, and 2010 psalm collaborators. 
two pages of collaborators. There's a Bible dictionary in three columns. It's 18 pages long. The font is somewhere between six and a half and seven points. So quite a few entries in the Bible dictionary. After the Bible dictionary, we come to a list of Sunday readings. So these are for Sunday Masses um, between 2011 and 2038 for cycle A. It's a three-year cycle. 2012 to 2039, cycle B. So this takes you to 2040 for Sunday Masses only, not for weekday Masses. And then readings for the major feasts of the year. So you have a table for that. You have a three-column, eight-page doctrinal Bible index and a 7.5 point sans serif font. Oh, here's a page that I did not quite separate when I was breaking this Bible in. Right, the, after that, you have an insert. Now, there are numerous inserts like this. It's on This particular one is on glossy, heavy paper. This one's called The Church and the Bible. It's right after page 444 in the end. We'll go back and we'll look at some of the other inserts now. Uh, at the beginning of the Bible, there's a presentation page on the one side. And on the other side, it's uh, about St. Joseph. So it has a series of 12 little images of St. Joseph. About page 370, we find our next one. These are glossy maps of Armenia and Syria, etc. here. So there are five such maps on four pages. Colorful, not especially detailed. Glossy maps here. Page 698. We come across our next group of glossy pages. This is uh, the Stations of the Cross. Page 1154, we come to some non-glossy heavy paper inserts. These are good to write on, and this is the family record section between the two testaments. Ends with deaths, and you come to the New Testament immediately after. On page 14 of the New Testament, it's interesting that the Old and the New Testaments are numbered separately. That may be an artifact of the way they've decided to update the Bible in stages, or it may be an indication that they intended at one time to print them separately, to bind them as separate volumes. Yeah, Mysteries of the Rosary, a little bit about the new luminous ones that John Paul II instituted. Uh, four maps after page 396 in the New Testament. So here they are, Palestine in the time of Christ. Jerusalem, a little um, illustration of the Herod's Temple, Paul's missionary journeys, and a physical map of Palestine. Again, not a lot of detail here in the maps. So we'll go back to where we were just a moment ago. You see there is no concordance. The, uh, here's our last insert we took a look at a moment ago. It's a paystone construction with a paper liner. There are red, burgundy, and gold head and tail bands, as you can see there. There is a single reddish burgundy uh, ribbon marker. It's 7 millimeters wide, so it's narrow. It's 236 millimeters long. It is uh, wide enough to come out at the corner, so you can use it diagonally in the book. It was put in a bit crooked. So I'll show you that. It really wants to come out at an angle like that to the volume. It would have been nice if it actually came out perpendicular. But it is what it is. In the front, we have the same sort of paste-on construction, the presentation page that we saw earlier. Um, Half Leaf, the title page, Catholic Book Publishing Corporation in New Jersey. 
Again, they print several different editions of this. This one comes in several colors. And there's the one with the cheaper cover that I showed you earlier. And there's one with a more expensive cover, which is only bonded leather, though. Bonded leather is to leather as uh, plywood is to wood. Except plywood is actually quite st sturdy. Bonded leather tends to crumble, deteriorate with time. And so it does have a Nihilobstet, an imprimatur, definitely a Catholic Bible. You have a preface. There is a note on the New American Bible from Pope Paul VI from 1970. Table of contents showing all the books and all the additional material. Vatican II's Dogmatic Constitution on Divine Revelation. Run this for several pages here. Right at the end of that. Those are the notes on the divine on the Constitution. Here's the learning about your Bible section. It's nine pages long. So I think this is fairly basic material about the Bible. You have a section on the Holy Land. This is eight pages and it's mostly black and white photographs. I kind of like them. There is a seven-page chronology of the history of Israel. Comes into New Testament times here. Abbreviations of books of the Bible. Key to references, so how to use the references here. And then we get to the Old Testament. And a preface to the revised New American Bible Old Testament. It's three pages long. And after that, there's an introduction to the Pentateuch. Um, they point out that here they've tried to translate the Old Testament um, more literally than was done in the previous edition. A thorough revision of the already excellent 1970 Bible. Um, and uh, they're trying to do it as accurately as possible, rendering it into good contemporary English. It's a more literal translation than the original NAB at least in many ways. Uh, they also talk about um, Qumran, Qumran manuscripts, so they're trying to use the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, but from what I can tell, uh, the previous edition did so as well, and it also relied somewhat on the Septuagint. So now we'll take a close-up look at the font. We're in uh, Mark 5 here. And um, as you can see, it's printed reasonably darkly. Um, the line spacing is certainly adequate. You have a descender here from a Y getting close to the capital H, but it's not too cramped. Uh, line uh, width is not too hard to uh, keep your eye on track across the line, so I think all that's well done. It's nothing extraordinary about the font. It's not especially attractive, but it certainly is not an ugly font. Here uh, is a comparison. This is uh, an old Douay Reims font on the right. Douay Reims paper, of course, is old and yellowed. And the font on the right is a bit darker. Um, not darker, I meant to say larger. Uh, the one on the left is certainly darker. Now I have the Ignatius Press Revised Standard Version Second Catholic Edition on the right. Certainly that's a larger font. It also seems a bit thinner in comparison, though. Line spacing is uh, very good on the right as well. Now on the right is the Didache Bible, and it has uh, quite excellent line spacing. I um, would point out that the, uh, although the font on the left is smaller here, you can get this text from the same publisher in a larger font. I think it's probably about 10 points. It does, uh, this Bible does have a sewn binding. It does lie open here in Genesis relatively easily, uh, particularly since I broke it in. There isn't a great deal of problem with the uh, pages not being flat. Uh, here, of course, if you wanted to read the left page, you would probably want to push this down. And if you were reading the right, you would want to push it over. 
but uh, there usually is enough margin that you don't have much of an issue with the page not being flat enough for your older eyes to read. Um, I mentioned it was a sewn binding. Let me show you the threads. So here in the learning about your Bible section, you can see that actually it has overcast stitching. So there's a line of overcast stitching that runs right through here. And um, there's actually stitching here in the gutter as well. So you have one, two, three, four, five or six, maybe five, two, three, four or five lines of stitching there. This edition has numerous black and white illustrations in it. So here you have uh, the world, the worldview of the Hebrews. This is sort of a sense of their cosmology. And then a map entitled The Peopling of the Earth. Just a few pages on, you have uh, Abram's journey into the Holy Land, followed by and Pentapolis, Dead Sea, and Jordan Basin regions. So this gives you a sense for elevation in the Holy Land. A few pages along, Jacob's journey to Padan Aram, followed by another map on the opposite side, the Flight of Moses. In the uh, New Testament, the New American Bible is neither especially literal nor especially free. Um, this chart shows um, my scoring of New Testament translations. I think there are 17 or 18 of them there, and the New American Bible is very close to the center. I'll give you a few examples uh, of places where the New American Bible is less than literal. Um, here we'll start in Matthew 5, 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. The Greek actually reads sons. Matthew 5, 16, just so your light must shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your heavenly father others is actually men and we'll go over to matthew 6:12 and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors um, forgive should actually be have forgiven so those are just a few examples of the kinds of non-literalness that you see in the translation i don't think you would uh, you would say that those are inaccurate. They don't give you the wrong impression for what's being said. What the uh, New American Bible Revised Edition revised was the Old Testament. You're looking now at Psalm 1 in the former New American Bible Old Testament, which reads, Happy those who do not follow the counsel of the wicked, nor go the way of sinners, nor sit in company with scoffers. Rather, the law of the Lord is their joy. God's law they study day and night. If you look at the note over here, note on one one, those literally the man, that word is used here in many of the Psalms is typical and therefore is translated they. When it was revised, the Psalm was revised, it reads more like the classic translations do, which are more literal. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the way of sinners, nor sit in the company with scoffers. This is the old generic man, that is, a person of either gender. The way English used to be spoken, rather the law of the Lord is his joy, the old generic his, and on his law he meditates day and night. There's another example, very similar one here in Psalm 14. The fool says in his heart, there is no God, etc. So that's the revised edition. The previous edition had fools say in their hearts, there is no God. In the New Testament, one of my favorite places to go to check for gender neutral language is Revelation 3.20. And I don't see much here. Um, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will enter his house and dine with him and he with me. I will give the victor the right to sit with me on my throne, as I myself first won the victory and sit with my father on his throne. So you see he and his in here. This isn't uh, garbled as it often is in modern translations, uh, where they try to rephrase it to avoid he and his. 
um, we'd like to show you something here while we're here. You see then is in brackets. Um, if you look at the Greek, this is uh, United Bible Society's fifth edition. You'll see this Greek word chi is in brackets as well. That's the word that they've translated as then. I shall come in to him and dine with him and he with me. So that's that word then. It's in brackets in both texts. What they've done in the New American Bible is the words and phrases that the United Bible Society's 5th edition, the Nestle Elan 28th edition, or 27th edition at the time they translated it, I suppose, those words that they um, include in the text but express some doubt about, they bracket, and so the New American Bible does the same thing to, uh, to give you a sense for how some translations deal with that uh, verse. Uh, this is the New International Version. Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. So that person instead of him to avoid using a masculine sounding pronoun, grammatically masculine program. Uh, yeah. Revised edition of the New American Bible, as its previous edition as well, often follows the Septuagint or the Dead Sea Scrolls. So here in Genesis 1-9 is an early example. Um, this section of the verse is from the Septuagint and uh, not from the Hebrew. If you look at your Revised Standard Version 2nd edition, which happens to be based on the Hebrew at this point, you see it ends with, um, let the dry land appear, and it was so and then God called, so it skips over uh, this portion of the verse from the colon down to the period here is not in the Hebrew. I believe um, the reason that they don't include footnotes telling you about these uh, textual issues is that they've decided to collect them all in a separate volume. So my understanding is that there's a separate volume that talks about the textual choices that the New American Bible translators made. As a second example of where the New American Bible Revised Edition follows the Septuagint, here is uh, Genesis 4, 8. Cain said to his brother Abel, let us go out into the field. Those words are not in the Hebrew. Uh, in this case, the Revised Standard Version second, second Edition also follows the Septuagint. So you see there it says, let us go into the field. And if you look at that foot, footnote H, we're looking at this portion right next to my thumb. If you look at the H down below. It says, uh, compare the Vulgate. This is from the Samaritan, the Greek, and the Syriac. Compare Vulgate. Hebrew lacks. Let us go out into the field. Another passage that's influenced in the New American Bible Revised Edition by the Septuagint and the Dead Sea Scrolls is here. Uh, Deuteronomy 32.8, he set up the boundaries of the peoples after the number of the divine beings. The Hebrew actually says children of Israel, so the divine beings thought here is coming from the Septuagint and the Dead Sea Scrolls. It's interesting, if you look at the uh, footnote that goes with this asterisk, you'll see that the, the note says that literally this is not divine beings, but sons of God. And if you look at... Um, the earlier edition of the New American Bible, you see that it says sons of God. So the earlier edition was actually more literal here at this. Here in Psalm 145 verse 13, there's this additional material. The Lord is trustworthy in all his words and loving in all his works. That's not present in most Hebrew manuscripts, but it is present in the Greek. Um, the previous edition of the New American Bible also included this. I'll show that to you here. The Lord is trustworthy in every word and faithful in every work. So, so the New American Bible Revised Edition is definitely willing to use the Septuagint, but here in Isaiah 7.14, which the New Testament interprets as a prophecy of uh, the birth of the Lord, and they decide to follow the Hebrew instead and say, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign, the young woman pregnant and about to bear a son shall name him Emmanuel. Um, I'll just show you the footnote down below. 
where they say quite clearly, they understand that the Greek reads virgin, and this translation underlies Matthew 123. So why don't they use the Septuagint here? Something simpler, similar happens here in Psalm 40, verse 7, Sacrifice and offering you do not want. You opened my ears. If you look in the book of Hebrews in the New Testament, you see sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. And so um, they decided to translate from the Hebrew rather than the Greek. Though they acknowledge here in the footnote down below that uh, Hebrews 10, 5 through 9 quotes the somewhat different Greek version and interprets it as Christ's self-oblation. It's interesting to contrast the notes in the New American Bible Revised Edition with those in the Didache Bible for, say, um, Isaiah chapter 60, Arise, shine, for your light has come. The glory of the Lord has dawned upon you. If you look at the footnote here in the New American Bible Revised Edition, it says the light the prophet proclaims to Zion symbolizes the blessing to come to her, the glory of the Lord. So this is coming to Zion, um, the return of her children, the wealth of nations who themselves will walk by her light. So the sense is that this has to do with Old Testament Israel. And then it mentions in passing that it's famous for use in the Latin liturgy for Epiphany. Now, the Didache Bible says this, the same passage. It's the first reading for Epiphany. The people from afar who brought gifts to the new city are a type of the Magi. The wise men are astrologers from the east who traveled to bring gifts to the infant Christ after his birth. The uh, footnotes in chapter 61 are kind of interesting as well um, in regard to what they don't say. So this is a passage, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. This should sound familiar to you. Proclaim liberty to the captives, release to the prisoners. Um, if you go over and look at the references, you'll see one here on 61, 61 one to Luke 4, 18 through 19. And if we look at Luke 4, 18 through 19, you see this passage, same uh, material. And Jesus rolls up the scroll and hands it back to the attendant, and he says, Today this scripture passage is fulfilled in your hearing. But if you look at the notes here, Or maybe I'm blind, maybe uh, I'm missing it, but I don't see anything here mentioning a messianic fulfillment of this passage. In Matthew 16, 21, uh, reads, From that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer greatly from the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and on the third day be raised. And there's a footnote down below on this passage. Let's pan down to it. And what does it say? It says, Neither this nor the two later passion predictions can be taken as sayings that, as they stand, go back to Jesus himself. The footnote says that Jesus didn't say that. In uh, Luke chapter 1, verse 46 and following, you have the Magnificat. Mary says, My Lord proclaims the greatness of the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior, because he's looked upon his handmaid's lowliness. Behold, from now on will all ages call me blessed. And if you look at the note down below, it essentially says that Mary didn't say it. Um, it may have been composed by Luke. The canticle doesn't really connect to the context of Mary's pregnancy. Um, the loose connection between the hymn and the context is further seen in the fact that a few old Latin manuscripts identify the speaker of the hymn as Elizabeth, even though they admit the overwhelming textual evidence makes Mary the speaker. Um, so it casts doubt on whether this is actually genuine. 
we should say a bit about the cover. I think I've kind of skipped over it. As, it. as I said, it's imitation leather. The uh, publisher calls it Duralux. So it's a relatively inflexible, but not especially stiff. Uh, you can bend it around uh, material, and it seems to have uh, been impressed. It has this artificial line of, uh, of what uh, looks like stitching in it. It has a cross Im embedded in it. A lot of uh, vine, vine work here. It looks like a bunch of leaves and then dots in a slightly different color. It's, it's well worked, and then impressed in the back, you have the uh, style, 609-19BG, and then there's the ISBN, if you can read it. The uh, edition with a cover like this one is uh, about $6 less, maybe $7 less. It's also available. Well, what do we say to sum up? Um, I really like the paper. I'm not a big fan of the blue tinge to it, but I think it's reasonably opaque. I like the way it's printed. Even with my old eyes, this uh, nine-point font is easily read. The uh, columns are not too wide. The lines are not too closely spaced. Uh, the translation itself, I, uh, I don't really understand a lot of the criticism of it that I see. Uh, it seems like a reasonably decent uh, translation. Um, not especially literal, not uh, wildly loose like the Jerusalem Bible or the New English Bible are. Um, I like the economy of speech that I read in it, um, but I suppose some people um, would prefer something perhaps more dignified for use in mass or something with uh, higher literary qualities. I don't know. Those of you um, who've listening listening to me some, for some time realize that I'm not a Roman Catholic, uh, so I don't hear this in Mass every week or every day, so as to uh, perhaps get tired of it. Um, so we talked about the cover, and we talked about the paper, and we talked about the print and the translation. Um, I do wish the notes were better. I am not a great fan of notes of this ilk. I prefer notes such as those that you'll find in a Bible like the Didache Bible, those that um, help to strengthen faith rather than notes that might cast doubt or cause trouble with pe for people with a weak faith. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this review, such as it is. If you have, please remember to hit the like button and uh, share it with your friends on social media and subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so yet. Thanks very much for watching.